Right. I think we'll get underway. So, Kate, um, thank you very much for joining us today. And um, we'll hear about how to rescue our gardens after a wet summer. Thanks, everybody. Um, this picture here is actually from 2011. This is the entrance to my street. So this is how high it came in 2011. And it, as I was saying at the beginning, I am finding putting this information out at the moment quite emotionally challenging because it was a very, very traumatic thing to go through. We tend to think of it as a natural disaster, something that happens to other people, not what happens to us. You see it on TV. So when you find yourself in the midst of it, it's massively traumatic. And for all of us who went through it before to find ourselves doing it again is really hard. In 2011, I think in my article, I started with mentioning the award that we won back then, which was wonderful and not why we did it, it was a big surprise, but it was a natural disaster and there was a lot of recognition around that and a lot of people were recognized for the work that they did. This time around, there is a different feeling and we are being told this is climate change and expect more of this. So we're being told that we need to toughen up, that we can't be emotional. We can't just say this is a natural disaster. It's a bit of a different emotional story, but plenty of us have the emotional scars, unfortunately, and are going to have to, there's going to be more and more of that. But as we all know, being gardeners, our gardens are a big part of our life's therapy, whatever we're dealing with. And that's the same in a natural disaster. And the reason we won that humanitarian award in 2011 was because we found the work we were doing to help people's gardens when they couldn't get into the garden because they were trying to make their house livable was actually making a huge impact on how they were coping emotionally. So the garden side of it seems like it's trivial when your house is destroyed and yet it does have a huge impact as we found. So the first thing, and this relates to anybody who's had a lot of water in their property, is just don't stand on waterlogged soil. Keep off it as much as you possibly can because it adds to compaction. The waterlogging will cause compaction in itself. And of course, when you factor flooding on top of waterlogging, the weight of the water, the depth of the flooding will contribute to the amount of compaction in the soil. But even if, and this photo was taken in one of our local parks, and in this park it didn't flood, but the volume of water through, you can see the damage it's done to what was once a thick, healthy lawn. And that was just from runoff water doing that. So the amount of water logging that we've had, even for people who were not actually flooded, is quite significant. And so a fair bit of this does relate to people who've just had severe waterlogging, not just riverine flooding. So stay off as much as you can until it has dried out. And the drying out process is often longer than we think. I took this little video two weeks after the flood in another one of our local parks. So this one here, sorry about that little warning. Um, this little video, the gray that you can see through this is flood silt over the, the weeds and the, the grass. And a lot of it is, the grass is there are all dead, but it's covered in silt, which is why it looks gray. But that's water just pouring out of the ground two weeks after the flood, which just goes to show how badly waterlogged the soil is. And we tend to sort of forget, we tend to think, oh, the rain's gone now, let's get into the garden and fix things. So just be aware of that and how severe is your garden really ready for you to climb into it. This here then it was now looking at signs of stress from water logging. The picture on the left is a Maria hedge that was flooded. So it went fully underwater and has dropped its leaves as a sign of stress. The picture on the right is a chili bush in my own garden and um, it didn't go underwater. So I didn't have riverine flooding, but I had severe water logging from overland flow from my neighbors. So I had about two inches of water sitting across the entire garden for five days. And that's actually not uncommon. There's quite a lot of gardeners have had that experience, even when they're not in a flood zone. So I think the impacts of water logging and the damage that that has done to gardens is going to be quite extensive outside the flood zones. So um, yeah, this is relevant to those people as well. 
So what's going on here is that combination of wilting and leaf drop. And now in my garden, it's three weeks later, I look around my garden, I can still see a lot of plants that are showing their stems where they were once fully leafed or are wilting or a combination of both. And both of those are indications of root damage. And this is what is key, is that the plant is doing what it would normally do in drought conditions where it can't absorb water. It can't absorb water because the roots are damaged. There's plenty of water in the soil, but the roots are damaged and the plant can't take up that water. With this scenario, pruning can be really beneficial, but it is really a nurturing of plants. It's now time to start seeing these plants as we would something newly planted that needs nurturing instead of something that has been there for 10 years and is well established because they've got to re-establish their root systems. The roots that are going to be the least damaged are the ones on the surface of the soil. And of course, the surface of the soil will dry out fairly quickly. And that's where regular watering now can make a big difference because it's in that surface layer that the roots are probably still the healthiest and will dry out quickly when we have a few hot, dry days. So we all tend to understand, mostly I think, the, the role of microbes in the soil and the structure in the soil. So this is a photo I took from the internet, but it really does show those fine feeder roots. And those fine feeder roots are the ones that are completely destroyed through the water logging. When that water fills the air pockets in the soil, this is what's happening in water logging. The water fills the air pockets in the soil. Any weight on top of that then squeezes the soil. But even without weight, as that water moves out of the soil, it does cause the structure to drop and damage. And we've lost worms have drowned and we've lost all the microbes in the soil. So we tend to find the soil is very dead after severe water logging and definitely after flooding. And that has a huge impact then on how well plants grow because plants really need that relationship with microbes in the soil. So that again adds stress to those plants that are struggling to grow in what has now become damaged soil. And if as gardeners, we can think that we're dealing with an issue of soil damage, it gives us a huge advantage in moving forward in how we repair that garden. I don't normally like to use chemicals of any description, but at the moment I am using fungicide in gardens and, um, and usually one application is enough. And there's a, a number of different reasons one is, as we can see here on the right, there's a lot of debris and dead plant matter has built up where gardens have flooded. In this picture here, you can see that it's a period of time has gone past since the flooding and you've got weeds starting to grow in where was once just garden. But you've still got all this dead plant material and that dead plant material can harbour um, fungal pathogens, particularly as it rots. On the left there is a hoya that is rotting from being under floodwaters and the stench of the rot of plants in that garden was quite hideous actually. But um, because something that's got a, a really fleshy leaf like a hoya really rots, that can harbour fungal pathogens. But when we consider that we've lost all of the good microbes from the soil, have drowned in the floodwaters, this now means the fungal pathogens don't have their natural predators in the soil. They have a huge food source and there's a lot of damaged plant roots, but they don't have their natural predators. So it's a system massively out of balance. And that's where a treatment of fungicide can be hugely beneficial at this stage. It should be done prior to adding microbes to the soil because fungicide can damage microbes in the soil. So we want to treat with fungicide first, give it a week and then add our microbes. Trees in particular I am focusing on when it comes to treating with fungicide. And a lot of trees will not show any sign of stress at this stage. We found in 2011 that it was about three months after the flood that we started losing trees. And the damage was caused during the flood. It's just that it takes time to show up in trees. And with the ongoing hot weather that we're all having, it's perfect conditions for things like Phytophthora. So, 
some trees will show it like this picture here if you see this sap around the bark particularly lower in the tree that's a classic indication of um, phytophthora infection but a lot of trees won't show anything until it's too late and once they're showing that sign of stress it's too late to treat you can't save the tree and that's why if we can get in early and treat trees with fungicide then add more microbes we can set them up to recover as best as possible and prevention is better than cure in this case you know a lot of trees will be unaffected and didn't need the treatment but it's um it's not the end of the world to treat and save just in case that tree has more damage than we realize and sometimes with trees you will get other issues with the flood water. There's a lot of rubbish in the flood water, so there could have been awful things floating into the trees which have caused structural damage. Trunks can have knocks from other trees washing into them. You know, there's been big chunks of rubbish, not just small things, you know, cars floating through flood waters and all sorts of things that can cause quite a lot of damage. So it is worth having a good look and keeping a close eye on trees after flooding. But even after severe water logging, look for signs of stress in trees because obviously to lose a tree is a fairly big deal in the structure of a garden, as well as in terms of things like climate change, of course. Silt then becomes a big problem for areas that had riverine flooding. This is less of an issue for overland flow but with riverine flooding, the silt is a major issue. You can see here on the left, the cracks in the soil. So with silt, it's super, super fine soil particles. If you were to, um, to crush it and, and just feel it, it feels like talcum powder. It's incredibly fine and soft. But when that dries, that sets like concrete. So to break open that crust, that crust there around that um, tree on the left, that's um, the Illawarra, Illawarra flame tree. That crust there is probably about half an inch thick. So a crust of that will um, actually stop any um, interaction between the air and the soil underneath. So that can be massively problematic. In the second picture, this is the lower half of the same garden. And the, the silt there is about two inches thick, which is why it's killed the lawn that at the bottom of the rock wall was once a, a row of leptospermums. They didn't survive. The casuarinas hanging over the wall will probably make it through. There's a, a little bit of dieback, but they should be fine. But their owners got in and did a good cleanup in this garden, but you can see the elkhorn there. They didn't wash the silt out of the elkhorn. And that is completely choked with silt. So that now has been lost. when. Potentially it could have been saved if they'd clean the silt out of it immediately. So the silt smothers things, but that crust on the surface of the soil can become very, very problematic. It can be really fertile soil, but you've got to incorporate it into the soil. As a layer on the top, it's just concrete. So what we found we were doing a lot of in 2011 was going from garden to garden adding microbes and then mulching over the top of it. Because in a lot of cases, it wasn't worth, it was too hard to even try and dig it. But if the sooner you can put mulch over the top of it, the sooner you can encourage microbial activity and worms back in, so it doesn't dry out and set like concrete and it gets incorporated into the soil. That's the best possible solution is to cover it with mulch, any sort of organic mulch whatsoever. We were lucky that we were organized on a fairly large scale. So we were able to get our local council to do things like drop a truckload of wood chip mulch as on a street by street basis. And then as a team of volunteers, we went and spent days just shoveling mulch into people's gardens just to cover silt and then go back and deal with the garden later. But it saved a lot of ongoing problems. If early on you can get in, put microbes into the soil and then put your mulch over the top. Coming back later will be much, much easier if you can do that. And of course the silt sticks to leaves and it doesn't, so many people say to me, oh, just don't worry, it'll just wash off. It doesn't wash off. The tree on the left there has been through two incredible storms since the flood, a complete whiteout rain. 
and you can see how much silt is still there. It does not wash off. So I do recommend that people get the pressure hose onto their garden. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but we did find, particularly plants that are completely covered, we could save plants by pressure washing and uncovering the smotheredness of the plant. Where it's got half of its leaf still above the, the flood line, it's not covered in silt, it can still photosynthesize, it can still breathe, so it can still exchange gases. So that, that will recover quite well. But the wastringia on the right there, of course, completely smothered. So that took no time at all to die and was probably gonna die regardless, but plenty of other plants have been lost simply because they never had the silt cleaned off them. We did see that plants that never got cleaned just languished, they just never thrived again. It's just because they lost too much energy from um, having smothering. They couldn't photosynthesize, they couldn't exchange gases. So it is important. And in 2011, we had teams of volunteers in a garden with a collection of palms actually scrubbing brushes and soap, trying to scrub silt off to allow palms to be able to photosynthesize again. It's incredibly sticky stuff. And as I said, they, it causes compaction. Water logging causes compaction and flooding causes compaction. So the weight of the water adds to the compaction. This particular house, on the left was the team of volunteers working doing garden recovery six months after the 2011 floods. The photo on the right was two years later, so that was 2013. So we certainly got the garden back into shape. In 2013, where that photo was taken, it was still the sort of soil you don't want to dig. It was still really quite hard. We had quite a lot of life back into it, but it was still hard going. So obviously by the time we got to this particular property and the water in 2011 would have come up to underneath these hanging baskets here. That's about their water line for the flood. Yeah, it was pretty significant. So they had the compaction issue, they had the silt. You can see um, that the ground on this side here it was just, you know, it had like a layer of concrete on it. It really felt like that. So it took a huge amount of work to break that open and get life back into that soil. We ended up having turf donated to that garden, thankfully, because there was no way we could get that grass back. It was completely destroyed. There were certain things that coped reasonably well with a good scrub, things like the croton here. They came back fine with a good scrub. We could get the silt off and get them to come good. But a lot of the smaller things had to be replaced. There's a lot of hippiastrums in this garden, which surprisingly did fine. They went dormant and then came back fine. Um, so that was, it was great to see the things that weren't lost, but there was plenty that was lost and had to be completely replaced. But the work in the soil at this point was backbreaking. It was really backbreaking. It was, and so this is where I say that compaction is a very significant ongoing problem. So for anybody who has walked away from their garden while they're fixing their house or waiting for insurance or, or whatever the reason, there's a lot of very valid important reasons, it, the damage is being done. If we can get in early and get some mulch over that, we can stop that severe compaction which really struggles then to recreate a garden. And for anybody who's had a lovely garden, and has had great soil, to see it become so badly compacted is quite heartbreaking. You really see that the process of gardening has been set back. It's not just that you now have some dead plants. That damage to the soil really sets back the process of gardening. And then, of course, there's the issue of contamination. So the picture on the left was a thriving vegetable garden. This is just around the corner from me. I walk past this garden every day. You can see the water line here in the lime tree at the back. This is the water line and the top here of the um, railing. That's how high the flood went. This was underwater for, this is now um, 2022, these pictures. This was actually a meter below 2011. So this is a lot less than we had in 2011, but this time around we had a lot more rubbish washed through. 
So that was on the left was a thriving vegetable patch. You couldn't see through that fence. It was thick, it was covered in edible plants. It was an absolute feast for the owners. Instead now it's dead, it smells, it's full of muck, it's full of rubbish. It's actually just up the street from here on this side here. Now this picture here on the right, again, it's the end of my street, that's the entrance to my street, slightly different angle to the first photo we looked at. But one of the key differences from this year versus 2011 is the amount of rubbish that we had. This year, it was filthy. It was so full of debris. So this photo was taken, I didn't think to stop and take a photo until we were winding up work for the morning. So we'd spent a good hour, we'd filled three rubbish bins. And at that point, my neighbours and I were prioritising taking out things like soft plastics and chemicals out of the flood water. The flood waters had obviously gone through a couple of garden sheds and we were really distressed to see that it was completely full of garden chemicals. And that was a real eye opener as well to think, all these chemicals that we as gardeners use and then put in the shed half used, maybe one day we'll get back to it. And all of a sudden they're floating in floodwaters. This is either going to recede with the floodwaters and end up in the Moreton Bay Marine Park, or it's gonna end up in somebody else's garden. So there is a potential here now for somebody's garden to not just have the rubbish, but have a dose of Roundup left behind, which just adds to the heartache. So it really was something we thought that at least we can do is take out what we can out of the floodwaters to stop it having impacts where it's not meant to be. So there's a huge amount of rubbish we took out. It was all covered in green ants that were trying to float out of the flood. And there was snakes, there was all sorts of things in the water trying to escape. So it was something you had to do very carefully. But you can see how much rubbish was there. There was entire raised gardens had floated away. So, um, but contamination risks go well beyond rubbish. If you're going into a garden that hasn't been cleaned up since the flood, please make sure you have a tetanus shot because you just don't know what is washed in. You know, a piece of timber with nails in it, broken glass, all sorts of things. So there is a risk factor there that you just need to be careful of. But just down the road from here is a sewage treatment plant. So there was definitely the risk of sewage in the floodwaters. And so be careful of that. However, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is, and I had the advantage that I was working in the wastewater industry before the 2011 floods, Sewage bacteria, fecal bacteria can only survive in ordinary soil conditions for 24 hours, but they can survive in water indefinitely. So it is a risk factor in flood waters, but once that water has receded and the soil is no longer waterlogged, it's no longer a risk. Once that soil has been able to dry out, those bacteria have died. If your soil is still waterlogged though, after a period of time, there is a risk that with the changes in the soil, it's broken sewage pipes. So that's something people need to look out for if they have ongoing water logging down the track. Other things that come through in certain areas, and again, it depends where you are, and often it's very localised. A local petrol station, a local industrial area. There was, in 2011, one of the gardeners that we were helping in Rock Lee was telling us that as he was evacuating, there were fridges floating through his back garden. And he could just poke the fridge with one finger and it would go spinning off on the oil film on top of the um, floodwaters. So that was pretty devastating for him because he had a garden full of rare orchids. And that ended up being taking all these orchids into a wheelbarrow. He pressure washed orchids to try and get oil off them, soap and water scrubbing them. And he was able to save about a third of his orchids by doing that cleaning. If he hadn't, he would have lost the whole lot. But we do need to be a little aware of what's coming through with the floodwaters. And then down the track, when you go back to garden, what are the risks in the garden through contamination? And there could well be um, bacterial risks, although the longer the time goes by, the less that is. There will be um, things like the rubbish that we talked about, there can be chemicals. 
So there's a combination of factors that we need to keep in mind. And one of those is if you're dealing with contaminated sites with any um, petroleum products, hydrocarbons, the best thing you can possibly do is leave it exposed to the sun. And this is actually what they do on commercial sites if they can't take the soil away, is leave it exposed to the sun because the sun will break down the complex hydrocarbon chains into smaller molecules. Then you really need to get the soil microbes back because it's then the soil microbes that will break those down further. So the ultimate answer to any contamination is going to be we need to up the ante on soil microbes enormously because those soil microbes will play a huge part in dealing with any contamination issues. So the one thing I haven't mentioned here, and but the vegetable garden is a real sign. If we want to eat out of these gardens again, we do need to pay a lot of attention to what could have come through. And one of the things that you may get through either industrial um, runoff or through the sewerage even is heavy metals can be a problem. However, there is, and I think it's not particularly well known, unfortunately, but there is a program at Macquarie University where any Australian can send five soil samples free of charge for heavy metal testing. So I highly recommend that we in Hort Media communicate that as much as possible to people so that they can take advantage of that service now and know and feel more comfortable about gardening after an event like this. It's, um, I think it's called the Veg Safe Program at Macquarie University. So, um, uh, Bayside, Victoria, 48 hours of ponded water in the garden and yet absolutely long-term water sitting still causes problems. Even if you haven't been flooded, but you've had overland flow, for most people, that's just a matter of runoff from the neighbor's garden. But for some people, it will be the contents of the neighbor's pool and a whole lot of pool chemicals. And that can cause um, damage to plants. So it's always worth thinking about what's upstream, what's uphill from you that's going to wash into your garden in events like this and what's left behind. But um, definitely be careful with contamination when you go into a garden after flooding, because that can be quite heartbreaking. Okay, come on, change slide. Oh, my screen's frozen. Okay, don't fertilize at this point because plants are stressed. So they can't take up fertilizer. Where we've had the heavy rain, you get a lot of nitrogen out of the sky. Where you get the silt, that tends to have a high nitrogen load as well. So we really don't need the nitrogen. What we need is the compost. We really need to be getting the microbes in. So having compost in the soil is gonna be essential. The organic matter will help open up the structure of the soil where we've had that severe compaction and then organic mulch over the top. Obviously, this is where we do need to be a bit careful recommending compost because these days, a lot of the bagged compost products that you can buy are enhanced. They're not just compost as we know it, as we would produce in the backyard. They're really concentrated and they have an MPK. It's surprising to think, but I've noticed some of the bags, if you look closely, have an MPK on a bag of compost. So once you do that, you're no longer looking at it as predominantly a source of carbon. It's becoming a source of nitrogen and that can become problematic. And a lot of the bag products are sterilized so they don't necessarily have live microbes in them. So wherever possible, homemade compost is going to be really beneficial. There are around the place a couple of landscaping yards, not a huge amount. So everyone's gonna to have to look locally for landscaping yards that do commercial quantities of compost that is live, has live microbes. So there's a couple around the place that do, but where you can get things like that to get it in to gardens on a large scale will make a huge difference. And then of course, put um, your mulch over the top. And of course, for people further south, down in Sydney or even further south than that, that you'll soon be coming into cool weather and you don't want to be fertilising in the cool weather. So compost is definitely the way to go. Oh uh, yeah, former, um, oh, zoos Victoria have commercial quantities of compost. That's really good to know. There could be other zoos that do the same thing. 
Yes, dry cleaners, commercial dry cleaners is another source of contamination. So there's definitely look around your neighbourhood as to what's likely to be a source of contamination in floodwaters. But I, I think an important thing here is um, a lot of this is local. A lot of what the impacts in the floodwaters are is very localised, but a lot of what we need to do to help is very generalised. So, um, you know, there's a lot of the same thing for everybody. So compost is going to be beneficial regardless of what has washed through your garden. Another major problem after flooding is seeds. That, um, and of course, this applies to people up on a hill as well who've had water washing through from their neighbours. And then think about as gardeners, who's downhill from us and where are the seeds from our garden going to end up in this sort of weather? It's a major issue environmentally, but this particular picture here is again, not far from me where I walk regularly. You can see in the foreground of the picture, the gray areas is where the grass has been killed by silt. And we've got a really good crop of castor oil plant has shot up. There are no castor oil plants within about 500 metres from this site. And the ones that are about 500 metres away have been completely killed by the flooding, but the seeds have washed away and are now coming up elsewhere. And that's a common problem. We found um, canna lilies was a big issue in 2011. Lots of gardens had huge clumps of cannas that they'd never had before. And that was because the seeds washed through. There was one garden had a fantastic crop of tomatoes and yes, he was close to the sewage treatment plant, so you can guess where they came from. There was another garden, yet again, had a really great crop of coriander come up. And that could only have come out of somebody's seed collection. So it really can be surprising what comes up, but seed washing through can be an issue after flooding or even overland flow with stormwater. That's another reason where a good mulching afterwards can really limit how much seed can grow in a garden. But it also is a reminder for those gardens that people can't get to and are unattended for a while, weeds do become a big problem. So where you're getting a lot of plants dying from the smothering effect of the flood, then you get weeds growing, people are waiting to find what insurance cover they may or may not have, waiting to get builders to come in. By the time they get back to their house, their beloved garden is just very compacted soil and a mass of weeds. So, which is fairly depressing to come home to. But the help is an ongoing thing. And I really do want to um, talk about this a little bit because I think this is where we all can play a part in some way that um, particularly if we live nearby, but some of the things to really think about is for the people who were flooded and whose homes were damaged, you can't think about your garden if you haven't got a place to live. You can't put any energy into restoring a garden if you're trying to create a house that you can take your family back to. So that's a really significant thing. But what we did find was even to mow the lawn, when they come back to work on their house and the lawn is mown, it creates a sense of order, a sense that things are okay. As opposed to coming back and seeing this mess in the yard, it takes some of the overwhelm out of it. So organizing lawn mowing for people who've been flooded is actually a really big deal. In most cases, they've lost their lawn mower because it would be downstairs, in the shed, in the garage, where would it, be? it would be flooded. So most of them have lost a lawn mower they don't have the emotional capacity or the time to think about mowing and yet it is very significant. The other thing we found was that cooch grass became a major weed in garden beds because the mowing wasn't done. So it then took over everything. And as all of us know, getting cooch out of a garden bed is a nightmare. So if we can just, um, even if we're a long way away, Get in touch with a local mowing person and say, can I pay for an extra lawn, for you to do an extra lawn every fortnight? It, it's a small thing, but it is actually something that we can do that does make a difference to the people who are dealing with their lives turned upside down. There will come a time, and it's not far off, that we need to start looking at donating plants. 
because a lot of plants have died. And, you know, gardeners, we love sharing plants. This is something that we can do. And we did in huge quantities in 2011, and I'm gearing up for that now in my local community and um, donating plants to people who've lost a lot from their garden because it's just too much to replace in one go. We can't replace somebody's precious orchid collection, but if we can give them a handful of things that brighten up the garden, we can lift their spirits and encourage them to keep moving forward in terms of being a gardener. But volunteering some time, just even take some time to knock on someone's door and say, can I give you a couple of hours work in the garden while you're doing everything else? And for me, this is how it all started, was that the garden at the end of my street was a beautiful garden and the elderly couple never came back to that house. It went under to the ceiling. They never came back and I don't blame them, but the garden was ruined. But that was where I could then set up a volunteer group so we could go into people's gardens with permission, I have to stress with permission, and work on saving their garden while they were working on saving their house. And that bit of work and just tidying it up, getting rid of the ugliness and having something fresh and green again really brings back hope and people need hope at a time like this. So doing that cleanup in the garden is really beneficial, but a bit of weeding and mulching as I, you know, I'm going to keep going back to that, but that mulching over the top of is so important to stop the severity of the compaction, which really limits them what you can do with the garden later. It's the longer you leave it, the harder it is. So the more we can get in and mulch. We were quite lucky that we were able to get, we've got a counsellor here who's really on board and she helped us to get truckloads of mulch donated. But um, so these are the sorts of things that we need a bit of, you know, for us as the Hawk Media to, to help get this information to people, to help volunteer groups have access to and know what they need. We had, um, at that point, we had Lions International came and tooled us all up so that all of our volunteer group had plenty of tools to work, which was very helpful, obviously, because we were all using our own tools. But, uh, um, and then we had mulch from the council, which was very useful. At that point, Neutrog were able to donate to us um, a whole lot of their go-go juice. And in particular, they donated us a whole lot that had was made up too strong, so they couldn't sell it but it was perfect for us because we needed all of those extra microbes. So, you know, it's really, there are a lot of different products now. There's a greater range now than there was then that have live microbes in them because we know more about that now than we did then. But um, so look for what's available to you, who's local to you that can donate and help out. But um, wherever you can weed and mulch will be really beneficial. Wherever you can give advice to volunteers to help get in and do something, but otherwise, donating plants is going to be something that's going to be needed for the next six months and all of this work there's easily six months worth of this volunteer work available in 2011 I did six months full-time volunteering and then had to stop and go back to paid work but um, there is a huge amount to be done and it's going to be ongoing so it'll be a long way from the news and yet there will be gardeners really struggling so I think it's something that we as a Hawk Media, need to be aware of and need to offer our support wherever we possibly can. So, questions? Oh, thank you very much. That was um, that was wonderful, Kate. Absolutely inspiring, and mm. it really is making me think. You know what? What can I'll try my video see if it works. Um, what can we do? What can the HMAA do? I mean. You know, we're scattered all over Australia. There's a lot of people in the flood areas. Um, I, think, I just wonder yeah, I how we can part of that is reaching out to those who support. are in the flood areas to offer the support um, where we can to give them the information that needs to go to the local community centres so that through the local community centres that can be organised. Um, and then I think some of it too is where we have the ability to contact um, nurseries to contact um, suppliers, things like that, and say, look, donations are needed here. I know just here in Yoronga, um, Searles have already donated a couple of bags of potting mix to one of our local um, little old ladies to, who sells plants at home, and she donates a huge amount of plants just to encourage that process. So wherever we can facilitate little things like that, it actually can make a big difference. 
Is there any opportunity for something to happen at MIFCUS? Where there's lots of visiting gardeners so who might like to donate or, I don't know. Look, it would be a nice thing to do. I think the difficulty is a lot of people just donate money. And at this point, it's not the money that's needed. It's the supplies, it's the, the labor. It's um, and mowing men. Mowing men can be so hard to organize because they're flat out. There's so much mowing work to be done. So even just finding somebody with a lawnmower who's willing to, um, to buddy with someone in a flood zone and mow their lawn for them is, is huge. I think we really need to try and reach out to gardeners, even through our Facebook um, and social media networks to say, you know, there are ways that we can help people who have been flooded. And um, the further away you live, the harder it's going to be. But I think some of it, what we need to do is just share our influence to get the message out so that we can communicate this to people who can do more. Um, I did have a question, um, and that, that was so wonderful. Thank you. Um, what kind of fungicides were you using? Were you, were you just using phosphoric acid yes. for the phytophthora affected ones? Yes. Yes. And, you know, we're not waiting for the phytophthora to take effect. So yeah. it's very much preventative. So, yes, a treatment with um, phosphoric acid is definitely something that I am doing at the moment. And what about on? I would normally do on a preventative scale, but at the moment, because it's so out of balance, yes, I am. And, and what about on that sort of dead plant material you were saying that could be carrying a fungal load? So it's fine to use the phosphoric acid across all of that as well. So, um, but a lot of that I tend to take out of the garden, so try and clean hmm. it up. And then, um, you know, if you can compost it, that's fine. That's where something like the um, Earth Life's breakdown product, which is based on compost enzymes, is really valuable because that has antifungal properties and helps that composting process. So it's really good over that dead plant material. But if you've got compost that hasn't been flooded, that is the best thing that you can possibly put mm. with any of that dead plant material so that you're getting the, the good bugs that you need to attack the fungal pathogens. Okay. Anybody else with a question? I was also wondering why why is that silt so sticky, do you think? Why does it stick on so hard? It's remarkable, isn't it? You'd think it's mud so it would wash off. No, think of it more like talcum powder. Is like it just because the particles are so fine? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, because and you know how talcum powder just sticks. And it just goes places you think how did it even get there it's mm. um it's the fineness of it that causes the trouble yeah yep yeah um, marion just wants to know the name of the um of the product oh the one i mentioned for earth life it's called breakdown and it's designed as a compost accelerator that breaks down dead organic matter um, but it has antifungal properties. So it's great to use at times like now. And you can use it throughout the garden. You don't have to use it in a compost heap. So it's safe to put on living plant material. So it's quite beneficial at times like this when you do have a lot of dead plant material in the garden to deal with. Mm. Thanks for that. That's Any other right. questions? Well, if there's no more questions, I'm sure that people might think of some afterwards, Kate, that they can, yeah. can get in contact with you. Um, so, look, I'd just like to say thank you very, very much for giving up your time today. And I really, you know, I'm really going to put my um, thinking cap on about what the HMAA can actually do. Um, I mean, obviously, my main concern was making sure that we all had the skills and knowledge to give the right information to people. Yeah, and I think but it's obviously that we keep sharing this information as much as possible, that, you know, it will be in needed on a very local basis, but the more we can share it, the more we can get it to those people who need it. Yeah, yeah. Kate, I, I would, I would I say the, the, the level of detail of the information that you've given, I would say that I have probably never read in a published article. Would would the other people agree? Absolutely. Yeah. So you know, could can can and we turn this in and start trying to get 
you know, organic gardener to run it and gardening Australia. And gardener has contacted me. Jenny Woodward has contacted me and asked permission to use it and I've given her permission yeah. to use it. Because I, I, th I think importantly is we need to communicate this and, um, you know, I never thought that I would be in this position of having to share this information. But, you know, mm. I, I learned the hard way from doing a huge amount of work but you know, really hoped I would never need to. But at the moment, I'm feeling very much like the more we can share this, the better, because it's not going to be just now. This is going to happen again. We're being told to expect more yeah. of this sort of weather. Mm. So it's, um, Kate, before you go, as Jennifer said, you can always think of a question when Jennifer says we're finishing up. <laughs> um, what sort of microbes did you add to the soil after the phosphoric acid to encourage the good, good, good structure? So, Back in 2011, we were using a lot of go-go -go juice because Nutrog mm. had donated that to us. That's right. what we had at the time. At the moment, I'm using a lot of Garden Mate from Earth Life, and that's rock minerals enhanced with microbes because it's a lot easier to get on because you don't have to mix it up. It's a powder, so you just throw it on. You don't have to mix it up in solution. It's easier to get on. But there's a couple of extra benefits to doing it through the rock minerals, and that is that... The garden mate has a very high amount of silica in it. And the silica is really useful for opening compaction in the soil. So that's very beneficial. It also has calcium and selenium in it, which are gonna be really useful for um, helping bind any heavy metals in the soil. And so see, adding I'm, the I'm sure a lot of horticulturists aren't aware of this. So it's like, it's like Helen said, um, you know, it, it just expands my knowledge. So thank you very much. Sorry, I shouldn't have interrupted. Not a problem. But adding all those extra minerals is really helping deal with things like the compaction, like the contamination. Um, minerals like calcium that are very soluble will be washed out of soils. Mm -hmm. So you know, th we're adding all of that back in. So it is a good time to add minerals rather than nitrogen. And, you know, Garden Mate has no nitrogen in it at all, which is another reason why I like using it. But it is very high in microbes. So, um, Kate, are you buying that? I am at the moment. I have been talking to Earthlife about some form of donation, but they, they just haven't organised that yet. Well, well, couldn't we at MIFCAS do some kind of fundraising to, to, to buy a bunch of that stuff that could then go out? Look, that would be a fantastic thing. And, you know, I'm sure if we did some fundraising... Earthlife would come to the party with, um, you know, a donation to, to match. Um, mm, yeah. Or uh, they sell it to us wholesale or something. Yeah, exactly, that sort of thing. So it's, I think that it's, you know, if we could get that out into flooded gardens, we could make a huge difference. Hmm. Mm. What do you uh, think, Jennifer? That's a good idea, Helen. Well, we'll, we'll do. So perhaps we need to also look at, you know, can we get some donations of things like sugarcane mulch, stuff that's easy to get there, you know, easy for someone to distribute. It's a lot easier for someone to take a bale of sugarcane mulch and spray it in someone's garden than to have to fork wheelbarrow loads of wood chip. So there's sorts of things that maybe we need to think, and it all depends locally on manpower that yeah. you've got volunteers able to actually go and use the product and put it in. And the more organised we can get local manpower, the more we can achieve. I did get in 2011, I had one street where I was able to get Bunnings to actually sponsor a whole street. And every house in that street was given a new lawnmower, a whippersnipper, a wheelbarrow, and some basic tools, some, a bunch of annuals to get their garden started, plus some fresh soil and some mulch. So, you know, something like that was fantastic. You've got to be very organised to do something like that. Yeah, that's what I saw as the problem is that it's really about local local solutions with labour and so on. And but I'm just thinking, you know, there are people, I'm in Sydney, I'm not going to be donating labour, but I'm happy to donate money. But as you say, just collecting money is difficult. But if it's to a specific um, purpose. It is yeah. difficult. And the other problem would be there is a lot of uh, what you call the thing. Uh, online uh, fundraising activities, which are a bit on the dodgy side. Yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Like a lot, and they're getting worse. Yes, and that's why I was thinking MIFCUS was a possibility. Yeah, what we, I think one of the things that I think 
we can do it and I know it's going to be difficult but something that we should be thinking about doing is that we can um with our influence when people reach out to us to ask us questions with our you know that we have some social media reach is to share that information and help inspire and give mentorship to somebody who can set up a garden recovery program locally mm. so um you know where we can't necessarily be there in person if we can give mentorship from a distance and help do um you know get them some of these donations from a distance that's still something that we can do if possible it's um i i know it's a huge um yeah and i would like to say that um there's when i've talked about products they're not the only products there are plenty of others as well that have yeah. micros in them these days so it's um you know by all means i think we all have our favorite products to use that have live microbes we all have a relationship with one company or another that we can use those connections at some on some level yeah that's a good point kate so um i think perhaps we'll have to wrap the um webinar up for now but i think you've given us lots to think about um whether individually we could um all um, approach various companies um, I'm thinking about maybe there's, you know, garden clubs or somebody in the local area that needs this kind of advice and information as well to, to they perhaps would have the membership to be able to, to assist. So uh, I think you've, you've given us food for thought and certainly I'll be putting something into our next little newsletter that goes out from HMAA to try and spur some, some action around the country. Um, yeah, yeah okay. so thank you. Yep. You're right with that, Jennifer, just um, getting that same story into the Garden Clubs of Australia magazine could be, would be really good, wouldn't it? Yeah. Can I yeah. just say thank you very much, Kate? That was really good. Thank you. Very yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you. Okay. And thank you, to, thank you too, Jennifer, for organising it. Not a problem. It was Kate's the hero today. So thank you, Kate. <laughs> thank and you, Kate. <laughs> thank you, everybody. We'll wish you well with what... Thanks. Bye-bye for now. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. You.